Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, where we're having a ball talking about the Beatles, the group, solo careers of them, any aspect of their careers, their music, their history, you name it. And we always have special guests here on my channel. This time out, we have Jay Bergen. Jay was the defense attorney for John Lennon. Um, back in the mid 70s, when there was uh, copyright infringement um, that involved a uh, Chuck Berry song called You Can't Catch Me, which John had used a line from in the Beatles song of Come Together. And this involved Morris Levy, who was a uh, record company owner, Roulette Records, also a mobster as well, which we'll talk about, um, suing John. And we'll talk about that entire court case. And it's all covered right here in this brand new book, Lennon, the Mobster, and the Lawyer, The Untold Story by Jay Bergen. Our special guest, Jay, welcome so much to my channel. Thank you very much for having me, Ken. I look forward to uh, talking to you and uh, answering your questions and passing on as much uh, info to the, your fans as I can. Yeah, I know a lot of fans are aware of this case, but they probably just know the basic facts. But in your book, you give all the details of what went on in the courtroom, and it's so enlightening. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Before we get to that case, can you give our, our listeners, our viewers, a background of uh, what kind of work you did as a lawyer prior to this case? Well, I, I clerked for a federal judge uh, when I got out of law school, and uh, I, that kind of led me right away into uh, litigation and trial work, uh, which I really loved because um, every case was kind of different. Um, and um, I'll give you a quick example. One of the, this one firm I worked with did a lot of work for Disney. And uh, I was very involved in a case where two songwriters claimed that they wrote the song Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, which was in Mary Poppins. Right. And uh, I did a lot of research, factual research in that case, and we defeated uh, the case. They, we won, Disney won the case. But uh, once I got to Marshall Bratter, uh, I represented, uh, this was 1972. Uh, I, I took over a case uh, where we were representing Terry Knight, uh, the founder and manager of Grand Funk Railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the band and Terry had gotten into a, one of these typical manager band disputes. Uh, and one of the first things I did uh, when I joined Marshall Bratter in October of 72 was to take uh, the deposition of Donnie Brewer uh, the night after they had appeared at Madison Square Garden. And uh, I handled that case for about a year and a half mm -hmm. uh, and took uh, Mark Farner's deposition and also Mel Shocker's. Uh, and we finally wound up uh, settling the case. Uh, the other um, kind of rock and roll case I was involved in, I represented uh, um, Albert Grossman when uh, in about 19, I guess it was 73, 74, um, it might've been after the Lennon case, but uh, Bob was told by his accountants to stop paying uh, Albert uh, under an agreement that they had made when they separated uh, early in Bob's career. And I was hired to, um, uh, to represent Albert uh, and then um, I wound up taking Bob's deposition. So uh, I, I generally did uh, a lot of trial and litigation work. Well, you were in the thick of it with those two acts there. Yes. So, um, was John aware of this? Was he familiar with you at all in any of the work that you did prior to this case? No, no because how I got involved was my, uh, one of my older partners, one of my senior partners, David Dolgenis, had been hired by John after he split with uh, Albert uh, with uh, Alan Klein mm -hmm. uh, in 1973 to help John negotiate the, the, the dissolution of the Beatles partnership. And I had handled a couple of small matters involving uh, John and Yoko. 
Uh, and I heard rumors in the office that there was this possible, um, you know, uh, pirated album that was coming out. And I went to David and I said, look, if, if there's any litigation here, I would like to be involved. So on February 3rd, 1975, uh, he called me down to his office and asked me if I could go to a meeting at Capitol Records that afternoon at five o'clock. And I said, uh, sure. Sure, he said, I think it's about this, uh, this bootleg album that this Morris Levy uh, is threatening to put out. Mm -hmm. So I went to the meeting uh, at Capitol and uh, with three Capitol lawyers, uh, one from Los Angeles. And halfway through the meeting, the conference room door opened and in walked John Lennon. And I was, <laughs> I was to put it mildly, I was stunned because I did not know he was going to be at the meeting. And I don't think the Capitol lawyers knew either. If they did, they hadn't said anything. And you know, we introduced ourselves and uh, uh, started, John started giving us some of the background uh, of the, uh, the problem with Morris. Uh, and uh, at one point, uh, the Capitol lawyers said, um, maybe we can get an injunction from a court here in New York City uh, stopping Mars from putting this album out. And I said, you know, that, that isn't easy. Uh, that's going to be difficult. And the other thing is that uh, I'm not sure that we want to start uh, any litigation because once you start litigation, it's, uh, Ken, it's like a war. You don't know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't know what the response is going to be. And I looked at John and I said, how long will it take uh, to finish the album because he had told us that he he did all the basic tracks in October uh, of 74 uh, and he was you know mixing the album and everything uh, and uh, he said I can do it in two or three days uh, in two days I'm sorry in two days and he said I'd actually like to finish it because I'm really tired of this album it's taken longer than any other uh, album I've ever done and I just want to finish it and, and get it out there. Right. So I looked at the, the Capitol lawyer from Los Angeles and said, well, how soon can you release it after you get it from John? And he said, probably a week, you know, 10 days. Mm -hmm. So by the sixth, two days, uh, three days later, uh, the parts, the metal parts had been shipped out from the cutting room, uh, which was uh, in the same building as the record plant where John was working. Mm. And Capitol released the album on February 13th. Less than two weeks from yes. when the meeting. Now, by the way, I'm sure our fans know this, but the album that we're talking about here is this one, John Lennon. Hey. And by the way, this is a counterfeit. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Um, I don't even remember when I bought this, but I've had it for a long time. And I know for a fact it's not an original. So. There's even uh, a video that is on YouTube, and I'm going to post a link for it to help fans know what's an original copy and what's a counterfeit. Oh, that's interesting. How, how can you tell the difference? Well, there's a number of things. I'll just mention a few. Yeah, never mind. Never mind. I mean, that's not part of our story, really, but I'm curious. <laughs> there's supposed to be John Shoulder at the bottom of the photo here, and it's not. Okay. An original has his shoulder on there. Okay. Also, there's supposed to be a, a sleeve on the inside with an advertisement, advertisements for other albums. Mine's just a clear white one. And I also have a pure red label and the one that was the original okay. said Adam 8 on it. It was an orange label and it listed all the song titles. There's right. all different ways you can tell. Okay. Um, I didn't know that at the time. I just saw it and I bought it. And I've had it all these years. But anyway, how come it took, because the lawsuit started in 1970, how come it took like three years to get the ball rolling on this whole thing? Well, the, you're talking about the copyright infringement yeah. lawsuit. That, that was filed by Morris in 1970. And as you probably know, uh, as a historian of, uh, of rock and roll yourself, Ken, that Morris did this often. Uh, he would he would file these bogus 
of copyright infringement uh, claims because he had his own publishing company. But I still have the complaint and I, I really should put that on the website, uh, but the complaint is only like three pages long. So, and it's, and it's solely about the lyrics that you mentioned before. And Morris didn't do anything to prosecute the case. So it just kind of languished there uh, in the federal court in New York for, uh, for almost three years. And finally, when John was recording in October with Phil Spector in Los Angeles, the beginnings of, of his, you know, oldies but goldies uh, album, um, he got a call from Harold Sider, who was his business manager, saying, you've got to go back to New York because the case is going to come to trial. And John said, I can't do this. You know, I, I'm working. I can't do the same two things at the same time. Just settle it. So the settlement was entered in October of 73, and that was that John would record three of Morris's songs, including You Can't Catch Me, on his next album, which everybody anticipated was going to be the rock and roll album he had started with Phil. Right. So that's why there was this three, this three year uh, lag time. Mm -hmm. And then of course, Phil, who was totally insane, um, <laughs> fired a gun off in the end of the ceiling in the in the men's room at the studio in Los Angeles. Hmm. Um, he disappeared with the tapes. It took until the summer of 1974 to retrieve the tapes mm -hmm. and send them to John. And at the time that John got them at the record plant, I think there were 28 boxes of tapes. Um, John was about to record his album of new songs which he had written because he was, he was frustrated that uh, Phil had disappeared and he didn't think he was ever gonna get the tapes back, mm -hmm. which turned out to be Walls and Bridges. Right. So he recorded Walls and Bridges. When that came out in September of 74, um, Morris starts jumping up and down on the telephone with uh, Harold Sider saying, where are my songs? Where are my songs? And he knew that Walls and Bridges was not the oldies album, but it was a way of forcing a meeting. He finally said, I wanna hear the story from, from John. Mm -hmm. In other words, I wanna meet John Lennon. Let me talk just a moment about Harold Sider. Now, this was a lawyer that worked for Alan Klein and he became John's business advisor, but didn't John have a falling out with Alan Klein? Didn't that affect the relationship in any way with Harold? Well, the story is that when, when John left uh, Klein, Harold left Klein also oh. and got a job. He was originally from Los Angeles, Harold. Um, he, and he got a job with um, Universal Music uh, Records and Publishing, Music Publishing. And he knew he was not going to be John's lawyer because he was then living in Los Angeles. So he, through another contact, got to David Dalgenis because he knew that uh, John needed a lawyer in New York since he was now, by now, John and Yoko were living uh, at the Dakota. They bought an apartment in the Dakota in 73. Right. So he was not, even though he was a lawyer, Ken, he was not being, he was not acting as, uh, as uh, John's lawyer. David was at the time. Okay. Now, as far as Morris Levy is concerned, was John aware of how dangerous a man he was? And one thing that struck me, at least this is the impression that I get from reading her book, he didn't seem all that intimidated by him, or maybe I'm wrong. I don't think he was. You know, I think John, we never really talked about it. Uh, he looked upon Morris as a character. Uh, in fact, I, I quote something in the uh, in the book, and I think he testified about that. Um, he he thought Morris was a character because Morris talked kind of with a throaty laugh because he claimed he had polyps in his throat, so he talked like that. And and uh, you know, he was born in the Bronx, um, got kicked out of school, I think, even when he was like before high school, uh, and um, he talked like a wise guy. You know, he, 
he, he was he was rough. He was rough around the edges. Yeah. And apart from owning roulette records, he was also connected to the Genovese crime family. It was even more than being connected. They really controlled him. Um, you know, they, they owned parts of his companies, his music publishing companies secretly. Uh -huh. uh, if, if you happened to be in, in Morris's office on a certain day, uh, you'd meet a couple of, uh, of the, the guys. Right. They'd be there hanging out. Uh, and, you know, you've, you've probably read uh, uh, Tommy James' book. I did yeah. several years ago. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was, he was ripping people off, uh, you know, left and right. And, and the money, uh, you know, <laughs> some of it was going to, going to the mob. Mm -hmm. When he opened, um, uh, the, the, the jazz club on, um, on Times Square in, in 1949, that, that, all that money came from, um, from the mob. And at that time in New York, um, clubs like the, the Latin Quarter, uh, Copacabana, uh, all of those places, they were all uh, secretly owned by, by the mob. Okay, and John never knew any of this. He never felt an obligation to tell him or maybe he was better off not knowing. If he knew it, we never discussed it. Uh, and it, it never came up. Um, I'm not, I don't think he did know it. I think he knew that Morris had kind of a, a, a shady uh, reputation. Uh, but when I interviewed uh, Klaus Vorman uh, in um, October, just before October, 1975, just before the trial started out in Los Angeles, uh, Klaus told me that John is very, very naive uh, about business. Mm -hmm. uh, he'll talk about, well, I, I'm thinking of maybe doing an album with uh, Bob Dylan. Uh, not, not even focusing on the fact that Dylan's with one record company and he's with another record company. Right. Um, and the other thing I learned about John uh, was that he did not like to, to say no to people. He did not like to decline an invitation. And he was very shy. Hmm. He was very shy. Yeah. Let me ask you something about this deal that was made about the three songs. Um, the three songs that John was supposed to record were from Morris's music publishing company, Big Seven. Um, and you say in your book that even if John's album Rock and Roll sold a million copies, Levy would stand to collect at most $60,000 from the use of three songs. Right. And so why make such a big deal with copyright infringement over that? I mean, I don't think that's a large sum of money. Why bother harassing John this way? Did he want to make more of a name for himself? I think, and it's just total speculation. I think it was just a way of him kind of getting his clutches around John. Um, and, you know, Morris was a grifter. He was, he was a con artist. So he, I think he just wanted to get his hooks into John some way right. uh, and, and, and see if he could, you know, kind of bootstrap himself into something more than just that settlement. And that's total guesswork, but uh, seeing Morris in, in action uh, and meeting him and taking his deposition, um, I, I think that's, that's what it was about. And when John tried to explain to Morris why the delay in those three songs, he told them all about Walls and Bridges, he told them about Phil Spector, holding the tapes, all that. So why didn't Morris just accept that and just wait a little bit longer? Well, because they were at this, <laughs> they were at this Club Cavalero, it's October 8th, 1974. This was where, you know, Morris wanted the meeting to be. And this was a kind of a bar restaurant where Morris was a member. And I guess it was a place he hung out at. Mm. Uh, and it was during the course of John explaining the fact that, you know, the album was going to come out and he was worried about the critics uh, who had been laying in wait. He thought they had been waiting for this 
uh, album because as you know, Ken, this was, John was taking a chance with this album because he was going to be interpreting uh, classic rock and roll, not just songs, but, but records mm. from the early 50s, the beginning of rock and roll, Bebop Alula, uh, you know, Little Richard, uh, one of, another one of his idols. Mm. And, you know, naturally people would, uh, critics would start saying, oh no, I was, no, you didn't do anything to improve the song. It's, uh, it's even worse than it was before. So uh, I, I think that uh, in explaining that, he came up, to this, came up with this idea to possibly, and he mentioned this to Morris, sell it on television. Uh, John was very heavily influenced by television. When he was home, a lot of the time, he would just lay in bed. Uh, you know, I've read this and I've heard this, uh, mm. reading the paper and watching television. And the television or televisions would be on all day in the apartment. Yeah. So it was a big influence. And, and he mentioned that to Morris. I'm thinking maybe we could sell it on TV. Well, Morris immediately jumped at that and said, ah, oh, I've got this company, Adam 8. That's what I do. I market albums on TV. And, but both John and Harold told him repeatedly at that meeting, but we're going to have to get the permission of EMI because I am exclusively with EMI. EMI owns everything I do, right. including, including if I talk. And Morris knew that because everybody in the business knew it, right? Yeah. They'd been with, he'd, he'd been signed individually and, and as a group with the Beatles since uh, 1962. Hmm. Now, going back to what you said about this album being a chance, you could also argue the point that it's the 70s. There was a big revival in the 50s, in the 70s, you know, and the Beatles were so well known for covering 50s rock and roll and did great jobs with them and early 60s rock as well. You know, a lot of people love the Beatles recordings of those songs in the 50s. So here's John doing a full album of it. Well, that was his that was his attitude. I mean, you're right, you know, uh, Twist and Shout. Uh -huh. His version of Twist and Shout's become, you know, like a classic. Um, but uh, I, I think that was his feeling uh, about it. And he was worried about the critics. Uh, and Morris jumped on it. And, and that, that was the uh, kind of the linchpin of the beginning of the problem with Morris. And then the problem was compounded because in November of, uh, of 75, uh, when, uh, 74, Morris kept harassing John about, I want to listen to my songs because he knew that they, he had recorded the basic tracks again. He was using, he was using some of the, the Spectre tracks mm -hmm. and then he brought the same band that, that recorded uh, Walls and Bridges back to New York in October. Uh, of 74 and they recorded some new ones. Great. Uh, and finally uh, at the Club Cavallero one night, because John used to go there with May Pang, I guess they'd have dinner and have some drinks uh, and hang out with Morris. And of course, Morris loved it because he could, he could show off to all his pals and, and the guests that I'm here with, with John Lennon. Uh, he, John finally called the record plant and told them to make two reel-to-reel -reel tapes because he asked Morris, what do you want? Mm. And he said, I want reel-to-reel -reel so I can play it in my office on my tape recorder. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I, I, I just think that, that Morris wanted to get this complete tape, these tapes uh, of the album, right. get, his, get his hands on them. And so, Later that evening, uh, two reel-to-reel, -reel, seven and a half IPS tapes were hand delivered up to the, uh, the Club Cavallero and John gave them to Morris so he could listen to the, the songs in his office. Right. What your book beautifully describes are all the, the complaints that John made about the Roots album and what was done. Every aspect of it, including what you just said, uh, because the sound quality on these reel to reels, which were recorded at seven and a half inches per section per, per um, second, um, 
would not be as good as 15 inches per second. That was one of the complaints. And these were also early mixes. Yes, he, he was not, John was such a perfectionist yeah. that, and I think this comes out in the book, that um, the album wasn't finished uh, until <laughs> he finally let it go out you know, right. to, to, the, to the pressing plant. He'd, he'd fool around with it, you know, right to the, uh, the bitter end. Um, and uh, so, you know, once they did the, the basic tracks and everything, he spent that, that fall um, mixing it and remixing it. And then finally, uh, he eliminated Angel Baby and Be My Baby because they were just terrible. Like the sound quality, the you know, there was a lot of drinking in the studio in Los Angeles, and uh, it, they were just bad. And Angel Baby was one of his all-time favorite songs. Yep, I know that from an interview that John gave to Scott Muni at WNEW. That's right. He said he loved that song, Angel Baby. Yes. Um, but he also said from reading your book that when they recorded it um, in Los Angeles everybody was out of tune, all the musicians. And even when John tried to sing it in tune, it still wasn't, it didn't match what the musicians were playing. Well, they had 28 musicians. Yeah. I mean, you know, people were showing up because they, all of a sudden these recording sessions became, you know, the party scene mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And so the musicians would show up and uh, sit down and start playing. And, you know, there was no, yeah, there was no organiz organized organization to it. Yeah. So the second meeting at the Caballero resulted in rehearsals at um, Levy's Farm. Yes. After, after the meeting on October 8th, um, John told Morris that uh, the band was coming in to record from October 21st to the 25th. And Morris started again nudging him uh, about bring them up to the farm, bring them up to the farm. And uh, uh, I think it was May Pang in her testimony or maybe in her deposition, uh, she got up to use the, uh, the restroom and came back and John said, we're going to the farm. And May, May said to him, what happened? You've been telling him over and over again, you can't go. We're, because we're going to Mick Jagger's for the weekend and, um, and Montauk, Long Island. He said, I, I just, I ran out of excuses. He, like he didn't want to just say, look, Morris, I don't want to come up to your phone, period. He couldn't say no. No. Like you said. Right. He couldn't say no. So off they went to the farm. Um, one important question here throughout this entire case is that there never was any written agreement here between Morris and John. Now, how could that stand up in court anyway? Because Morris had said, and, and his lawyer, uh, Shirtman was the name? Yeah, sure. That, that it was an oral agreement and eventually there'd be a written agreement. But how could that stand up in court? Do oral agreements ever stand up? Yes, no, it, it is possible under uh, a, a law that I will not be able to explain to you. It's called the statute of frauds because I've been uh, out of the practice of law for, for, for so long. But under certain circumstances, an oral agreement can be enforceable. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Morris uh, actually admitted on his deposition that he never anticipated that there was going to be a written agreement. Although he tried to claim that uh, that there was going to be a written agreement and Shirtman tried to during the trial. But uh, I pointed out on cross-examination uh, to the judge, here's, here's Morris's oral testimony. Uh, I mean, his testimony under oath at his deposition last year. And he said, no, we didn't anticipate there was going to be a written agreement. That's why, you know, he wrote that that January 9th, 1975 letter to Harold Sider hmm. and uh, to Dalgenis saying, David Dalgenis, my partner, saying, we have an agreement. And it was never answered. David told 
Harold about it. Harold said, send it to me, I'll take care of it. It was never responded to in writing, although Harold told Morris multiple times, we don't have a deal, we still have to get permission from, from EMI. Okay, just out of curiosity, is, is Harold still with us? I don't think so. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I tried to reach out to him when I was uh, writing the book because May Pang uh, gave me a number where he was living in Los Angeles. And, uh, and May said, uh, he won't call you back. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, Harold and I got along very well. He was an important witness. Um, but I, I don't know whether he's passed on or not, but he, he'd be pretty old. He'd be in his nineties by now. Okay. Just thinking of people that would still be very interesting from this time period. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. No, he would be. I want to just mention just to depart from, um, this court case. I loved when you shared a few stories about spending some time with John in New York City. You took him to Grand Central Station, which he had never gone to before. Right. And what was that like? Well, you know, we, it was, it was the, the, the lunch break on uh, the first day of uh, uh, John's deposition. Mm -hmm. And Morris's lawyers were right on Madison Avenue and 43rd Street. We came out onto the street and uh, I just had this idea. I said, uh, uh, come on, let's go to uh, uh, the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Station. Because hmm. uh, the Oyster Bar was a, you know, was a famous, as you know, a very famous restaurant at the time. Yeah. And he said, oh, I've never been to Grand Central Station. And I said, well, then you're in for a treat. Uh, and we walked in off the Vanderbilt Avenue uh, entrance, which, which was on the west side of the, of the uh, station. And there's a balcony there and you look out over this vast floor and this beautiful, beautiful room with a mm -hmm. spectacular ceiling and uh, the, it was just an amazing room. And, and we just stood on the balcony there for a uh, uh, period of time while John took it all in. And then we went down the, uh, the marble steps onto the floor and we walked around. And uh, I kind of stood a few feet away from him and he, he just, wandered up and down looking at the, uh, you know, the information booth is right in the middle of the floor. Uh, and um, I don't know whether anybody recognized him, but nobody bothered him. Nobody, nobody paid attention. Uh, we then went down to the oyster bar uh, and uh, he whispered to me uh, as we were just approaching where the maitre d' was standing. And he said, Jay, see if we can sit up against a wall. So I asked the uh, maitre d' to take us uh, over to uh, what turned out to be the south wall. And as we got to the table, John said, will you sit facing out and so that my back is to the, uh, the rest of the room? And I said, yeah, sure, sure. So as soon as we, as soon as we sat down and they, uh, you remember they have those big black and white uh, laminated uh, menus. Okay. They, they hand out there. And um, so a couple of the bus boys came over and asked for an autograph. And John, this was John's rule, not while I'm eating. Mm -hmm. I'll give anybody an autograph as long as I'm not uh, eating. And he said to them, after I finish eating, I'll give you the autograph, which he did. Very cool. Very understandable. Yes. Not wanting yeah. to be bothered, but still. Yeah, he was very polite about it. Yep. Um, yeah. Mm. You were telling me, I want to make sure I don't forget to say this, this is before we started to record this, that in all the time that you were with John, you never saw him uh, smoke a cigarette or drink? No, no. And never saw and never heard him use profanity. Uh, and he certainly had <laughs> and plenty of cause to, to do that when we would take our lunch break uh, during the trial and you know some outrageous statement would be made by by Shirtman or uh, you know or Morris when he was testifying but right. no, never heard him 
Never heard him use profanity. Wow. It's like the consummate professional in the way he presents yeah. himself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I made a note here because anytime there's a quote from John that I found interesting, I wanted to, to talk about it here. This is just funny what he said about Alan Klein at the trial. He said, Alan Klein lives in a dream. <laughs> Klein's greatest statement is that no contract means anything and it could all be read 200 ways and you know that suited him. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, Alan Klein did testify. Right, he did. He did. They they brought him in to testify, uh, hoping that he would kind of somehow bolster uh, their case. But he didn't. He didn't, didn't. He he say damaged that, their case. Didn't he say that no matter what, you still need EMI's permission to do this? Yes, he did. And he said he. he furthermore, he said I told Morris that uh, in February of uh, 1975 before. Uh, he released uh, the album. And Morris, well, they, they changed their tune in court about this. Wasn't there confusion? Didn't they say they weren't sure about foreign rights, but they felt that in the U.S. they could do this, make a TV offer. But the big confusion was over the, the foreign rights to Roots. And, yes, you're right. You picked up on that, Ken. Uh, and, and that was a critical point. And when it, when it happened, um, we were all really stunned because right from the beginning, uh, starting with that January 9th, 1975 letter, I have a worldwide agreement to, to market this album on television. Uh, they made that same allegation in the two complaints they filed, one in New York Supreme Court, one in the federal court. Um, I served uh, them with uh, this really obscure thing that's uh, 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 in the New York Supreme Court. It's called a, a bill of particulars. Mm -hmm. You can serve on the other side. Tell me the particulars of your claim. And again, they repeated it there. They repeated it in answers to interrogatories. We wound up with, I would guess there were 10 eight to 10 different times when that, set, that contract, that alleged oral contract was repeated, the same language. And then all of a sudden they realized they couldn't prove that right. and, and shifted ground. And that's when, uh, that's when Morris really got in trouble uh, testifying because we were able to really take him apart. That's a very key point that you, that you mentioned. Yeah. I want to say that to anyone that reads your book, there's a lot of information you'll take in that you didn't know before. But what grabbed me the most was to see how John conducted himself in the courtroom. To me, I think you even said somewhere in the book that this was like he was the best witness you could ever hope to have. He knew exactly what to say. I mean, you prepped him, but there are some things that I felt from, from reading the transcripts were very spontaneous and off the cuff, I think anyway, you can correct me there. But um, everything he said in the courtroom was exactly what was needed. He was very comfortable. He didn't seem to show any nervousness. He just wanted to get this over with. But, you know, he, he was exactly the ideal client that you'd want to have in a courtroom saying exactly what was needed in this case. Well, and he was, and, and he not only, he was the best witness I ever had, and that includes, you know, the number of years after uh, this case, because um, I, I was always, uh, one of the things I learned early in my career that I, that I really focused on were the facts. You had to have the facts down, mm. and good and bad, and I always told clients, look, you got to tell me everything because the, the worst thing is to have a surprise uh, in the courtroom. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I, I kept talking to John and May and Harold uh, and we, we got the facts and the facts were always the same. 
uh, and you know they didn't change as unlike Morris who couldn't keep the facts straight mm -hmm. because he was lying most of the time. So, um, and I think another thing that helped John uh, was well, two things. One, he was probably, how many interviews do you think he had done by the time uh, we were in court in 1976 or getting ready for this trial in 75? Hundreds, thousands, uh, you know, and he was always very, very quick uh, on the, on the uh, uptake in the interviews. The other thing I think that was important was that he was in court every day. Morris didn't show up a lot. He wasn't there a lot. Uh, I think he realized the case was, was going badly and he did not want to want to be there. But John was there with Yoko every day for 20 days over January. We took a break in February, March and April when the case, uh, when his role in the case was finally over. So I think that helped to make him comfortable, you know, that's mm -hmm. what he was doing. Uh, you know, he'd get up in the morning, get ready, come down and pick me up with their, with their limo. They'd come up to the office for a while. We'd go to court, he'd testify. Then we'd go off to, for lunch to, uh, to Sloppy Louis, where we, where we ate every day. <laughs> Another thing I picked up in this book, I wish that place still existed. <laughs> ah, you and me both. You and me both. So I think that was all, uh, I think it, the whole thing made him very comfortable. Uh, and, and you're right. The other thing is he wanted to get this over, over with. Mm -hmm. I told him that this federal case was going to move very quickly. Uh, he, was, he was very excited about that. And we got to trial uh, in 10 months. That's very unusual. Mm -hmm. Because he had this, we had this judge starting off who was a racehorse. He wanted to, he wanted to get to the finish line. Okay. Now I want to make sure, since you said that John and Yoko were there all the time, Yoko never had to give any testimony. I'm sure because she wasn't there when John was with Morris. Right. So she did not. She yeah. did not. Right. But um, she were the musicians that were on rock and roll did give testimony. Jesse and two, yeah, two of them did. And Eddie Matau. Was that how you pronounce his last name? Yeah, Matau. Yeah. Okay. And 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 how was that? Um, I don't hear as much about Eddie. Love to know more about him because I know he's a really good guitar player who also played on Walls and Bridges. Yeah. Yes. Eddie is now producing a uh, an album. The last time I talked to him, uh, by um, Paul Stuckey. Okay. Of Great. Peter, Paul, and Mary. Okay. And Eddie lives in New Hampshire. Uh, Paul apparently lives in Maine, and they're they're doing the 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 production of this album. Uh, uh, I don't know what 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 state it's in now. In fact, uh, Eddie's son drum. Uh, Eddie's son is playing drums uh, on this album. Hmm. Um, so uh, Eddie was, was very helpful. Uh, and Jesse Ed Davis was, uh, was a classic witness. Very, very smart. Uh, uh, Eddie, uh, Jesse was, was a key witness. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, you know, John warned me about uh, Eddie, about uh, Jesse, because uh, he said, you know, Jesse loves to party. And, and it's a tragedy that uh, Jesse died in uh, the early 80s of an overdose. He was a very, very smart guy and a great, great guitar player mm -hmm. and, and fun. Did you spend uh, you know, a lot of time prepping uh, Jesse and Eddie for this or? Because basically there's, they just talked about the rehearsals, right? At the farm. Yes, that's, for him. That's, yeah. that's why I brought them in because at the, as we got closer to uh, the trial in the fall of 75, I suddenly thought, I, got, I, I went up to the Dakota to talk to John about this. Um, I got to interview these witnesses because um, Morris is going to make the argument that this coming to the, to the farm was part of the agreement. 
part of the oral agreement that he he brought the band up there. Uh, he fed them, you know, and uh, you know, and was showing them off. Right. So I arranged with John to go out to Los Angeles, and I interviewed Klaus Foreman, Jim Keltner, the drummer, Kenny Asher, mm. um, Bobby Keys, the sax player. Uh, in fact, this is a story that's not in the in the book, but uh, when I interviewed Bobby, uh, he said. Uh, he said, I don't want Morris Levy to hear my name. <laughs> do, not, do not bring up my name to Morris Levy, because if you remember from your rock and roll history, Bobby Keys started off in Texas with Buddy Knox and the Rhythm Orchids. And that, that big hit they had in the 50s, Party Doll. Right. And um, Bobby couldn't read or write music. Uh, everything he played was, you know, was just play something, play uh -huh. something, Bobby. And uh, so he wanted no part of, uh, of Morris Levy. And I really didn't need him because he didn't come up to the farm. Okay. He, only, he only came in after they laid down the basic tracks. Uh, but, uh, and then on my way back to Los Angeles, from Los Angeles, uh, I interviewed um, Jesse Ed. Uh, in Detroit, where he was on the road with uh, Rod Stewart and the Faces. Okay. I, I'm going to tell you a story that is not in the book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the night I interviewed Jesse in a hotel outside of uh, Detroit, and they were going to appear in Cobo Hall, um, after I finished talking to him, and, and even then I decided after about an hour, an hour and a half in his room, uh, that I was going to use him as a witness. Mm -hmm. um, he was very quick, he had a great sense of humor, uh, and he said, so uh, what are you doing tonight? And I said, you know, nothing. Uh, I'm going back to New York tomorrow. Uh, and he said, do you want to come to the show? I said, oh, yes. <laughs> Certainly. He said, okay, meet me in the lobby at seven o'clock. So down, down to the lobby, I go at seven o'clock and uh, the band is there. Uh, Tetsu, um, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie Wood, you know, they're, they're all there. They've been drinking. Um, and uh, also the, uh, the tour photographer. Uh, so they give me, a, give me a backstage pass, which disappeared. I wish I, I, wish I had it. Mm -hmm. And we were waiting for Rod. And we sat there for about 45 minutes. And finally, out of the elevator comes Rod with his then girlfriend, Britt Eklund. Right. Who was later married to Peter Sellers, mm -hmm. uh, the Swedish actress. And they, they come out, they're dressed in long coats, fur coats, very expensive coats. And the two of them go right through the lobby with, as if we're not even there. <laughs> uh. with, <laughs> with the tour manager. They get in a limo and off they go. The rest of us file out and we get in the limo and pack into the back of the limo. And uh, I remember Ronnie Wood had this, this beautiful uh, African-American woman who was, who was with him. So off we go. We go, to the, we go to Cobo Hall. We drive in underneath Cobo Hall. And I'll shorten the story. Uh, and a tour photographer uh, said to me, you know, Stay close to me, stay close to me. So we, we go into the, in, up to the, the auditorium, to the uh, arena, and there's a big stage that's built at one end of the, of the, uh, of the stage. Uh -huh. And I couldn't see because I couldn't get out in front of the, the barrier where the, the police were. So I was kind of backstage and I noticed that there was a bleachers that had been built on the stage. And halfway through the show, a dozen violinists climb up the steps, get onto the bleachers, and, a, and accompany Rod in a cup, on a couple of ballads. After, after they finish the two ballads, they come down, and I think to myself, I'm going to try and get a better look. So I climb up the stairs, and I kind of crouch under the bleachers. And the band is playing. They've gone into another, the next number. And I stand up and I realize, oh boy, 
um, I'm right on stage. <laughs> Band is out in front of me. Um, the 16,000 or 14,000 fans are on their feet, you know, screaming, and I don't see Rod. And I'm thinking, I wonder where he is. And I turn to my left, and he's standing about three feet away from me. And he looks at me and he says, Who the F are you? <laughs> this is, I mean, just picture this, Ken. Yeah. A band is playing, the crowd's going berserk, uh -huh. and he has the presence of mind to know this is somebody who shouldn't be here. <laughs> so he, he turns away from me and starts waving to get the attention of one of the roadies on the other side of the stage. Yeah. And I thought, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I ducked down under the, <laughs> under the bleacher, down the staircase, and mixed myself up in the, in the crowd backstage. And after the show, we went back to the dressing room and I'm trying to, you know, hide because I don't want, I don't want Ron to say, to see me and say, yeah. I don't know what that guy was doing on stage. And I wanted to ride back to the hotel. <laughs> Didn't want to get anyone like Jesse to defend you, huh? Uh, no. No. Last to get in more trouble. Yes. Right. <laughs> wow. Now there is a story. There is. That is. I'm, I'm going to put it on the website soon, but I'm, you're, you're the first one I've told it to. Okay. I wonder if that was filmed. I don't know whether they filmed it or not. I did find at one point uh, a set list in, uh, in Ronnie Wood's um, archives that, that were on, online someplace. I just stumbled on it. Because mm -hmm. I think Bob, Bobby Womack was on that tour. He, he appeared that night okay. on a couple of songs. All right. Well, um, let's get back to the case because there's still a few more things I want to talk about. It's such a fascinating story here, but uh, May Pang did give testimony. And yeah, how she? She did. She was good. She was good. I, I, you know, again, I said to her, May, just, just answer the questions. You know, you know the facts. You know what happened. You were there. And uh, she was fine. She was fine. Okay. Um, also, I wrote down so I wouldn't, I wouldn't forget, a list of the complaints that John and Capital made to Levy about Roots. So just, we can bring this up. The album cover, which uh, they thought was really shoddy. And there were some great quotes from, from John. I, he's seen bootlegs that look better than this. Yes. You know, um, the poor sound quality, which we talked about earlier the two extra songs that John didn't approve of, um, that because Morris put out Roots when he did, it forced rock and roll to come out sooner. And there was only maybe five months in between Walls and Bridges and rock and roll, which right. could hurt the sales of rock and roll, as well as Roots being out at the same time as rock and roll and the confusion. Um, not enough time to promote rock and roll because of it one the one interview that you mentioned with uh yep. scott muni yeah and um they had to lower the list price or they felt they should for rock and roll to help the sales of that so all these things were brought up in in court so it was you know very well executed i think well remember that the other thing uh ken that was really important was uh Dave Marsh's testimony hmm. uh, about the fact that the on the back of the album, uh, the Roots album, when they listed the song Bebopalua, it said John Lennon. They didn't give any writer's credit. So hmm. that was that was really critical. And, and Dave said, you know, since a lot of the people who uh, would have bought this album weren't even alive when some of these uh, songs came out in the first place, they, that was really bad because they would think that John Lennon was claiming that he wrote the songs. Because if you looked at the back of the rock and roll album, mm. there were the proper credits 
for who the writers were, who the music publishers were. Right. Yeah. Good. Another another example of just kind of sloppy. That Morris didn't care. You know, just mm -hmm. Get it out. Um, you should also talk about the judge. Actually, they changed the judges from the beginning, right? The the second judge, Griesa, is that how you pronounce his name? Griese. Griese. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> right. um, he was a trained classical musician, and that played a big part in this case because he was very curious to learn everything about John and the whole recording process and the differences between all the albums that he put out. And um, he seemed very open-minded to learn all about all that stuff from John. Oh, he, he was fascinated by it. And, you know, I mean, we talked earlier about how, you know, Shurtman probably deliberately blew the case up because it was going so badly. And not only did, did, was there a mistrial because he was waving around the Two Virgins album with the, <coughs> with the nude photos of John and Yoko, mm -hmm. um, but then he baited the judge into an argument where the judge recused himself. And so all of a sudden, in the middle of the second day of a jury trial, we didn't have a jury because of the mistrial, they had been discharged, mm -hmm. and we didn't have a judge. And that's when I told everybody, I'm going down to see the chief judge. And the chief judge, uh, Edelstein, was at, was at lunch. Uh, I dictated a memo uh, telling him uh, what had happened. Uh, and, and we left. And, and it was funny. One of the only times that Yoko said anything during the, during the trial was when I went back up to the courtroom and I said to John and Yoko, here's what's happened. Judge Edelstein now knows that we need another judge. And Yoko said something like, oh gosh, this, this, this shouldn't have happened. You know, this, this was a mistake. And John said, Yoko, Jay's in charge. And uh, by the time we got back to the office after having lunch with the Capitol and, EM and, and uh, Apple uh, lawyers, um, there was a message to come back down because Judge Grisey had been assigned uh, to the case. And it wasn't until that night uh, that we found out uh, that he was a classical musician. And that, that was such a stroke of good fortune mm. that I didn't tell John about it until he came in the next morning to the office. I called him and said, we've got a judge and we're going to start again tomorrow morning, and it's not going to be a jury trial uh, because we both sides waived the jury. But when I told him the next morning, I said, I really got some good news for you. This judge is a classical musician who plays the harpsichord and, the, and he's a pianist, and he knows nothing about rock and roll. He knows who you are. He knows the name, mm. and he knows the name, the Beatles, but that's it. Uh, which I, I think initially amazed him, that amazed John, that he yeah. didn't, this is somebody who was living, uh, who was, you know, uh, old enough to have been yeah. in that era when the Beatles were really big. And if he had known John's music and was a fan, he might have been accused of being biased then, right? Yes, that's, yeah, that's a good point. I'd never thought of that. I really, I'd never thought of that. Yes. <coughs> you, wouldn't want somebody, you wouldn't want somebody who was kind of, you know, playing up the job. Right. You know, since you mentioned, uh, you know, two virgins and all, I found it really interesting how John defended himself when Shirtman said that, you know, how could you complain about lack of sales for rock and roll when the first three albums that John and Yoko put out didn't sell that well? You know, Two Virgins, Life with the Lions, uh, Live Peace in Toronto. And John was explaining that those are avant-garde albums and you can't put them in the same category as pop rock albums. So he automatically had an answer ready. Oh yeah, oh yes. And, you know, the other thing was that Shirtman brought up uh, that this was in poor taste because the, John was saying that the Roots album was in poor taste because of the cheesy cover and everything and the terrible photo. 
<clears throat> excuse me, but he also um, uh, was complaining just about the album and, uh, and being in poor taste. And that's when Shirtman brought up, well, how about the fact that you put out this nude album? Mm. Wasn't that in poor taste? Uh, and then Shirtman asks him to autograph the album. <laughs> right, right when John is on the witness stand uh, in front of the judge. I mean, talk about blowing up your argument on poor taste. Yeah. And John said, oh, sure, be glad to do it. It's a collector's item. <laughs> Not a good lawyer right there. <laughs> well, you know what, the, 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 one of the keys here, uh, Ken, was that he wasn't prepared. Yeah. Because he turned over the case to a very young partner and he didn't get involved until the trial. And you can't do that. Mm. You've got to be prepared. Uh, I mean, I had lived with this case now for, you know, uh, a year and a half and uh, I knew everything cold. And that was a, that was a fatal mistake that he made. Mm. You also had three key witnesses from Capitol Records there to testify, which I think really strengthened your case there too. Yes, that was part of Capitol's uh, case on the, on the counterclaims. Bascar Menon, right. uh, Don Zimmerman. Um, Harold Posner. And, and Posner. Right. And going back to what you were saying earlier about how, uh, how relaxed John was, um, remember in the book, the part where uh, Posner is on the witness stand and John suddenly gives an answer and he's sitting in the back in the spectator section where, mm -hmm. oh, it's all rock. Right. It's all rock music. And, and I decided, well, I'm going to get him on the witness stand. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so he was called back and John says, Am I still under oath? And the judge says, yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about being calm, cool, and collected. You know, maybe he watched a lot of crime TV shows. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But he was, he was ready. There's no doubt about it. Um, I want to bring up two things that I learned about rock and roll that I didn't know before, what the plans were for this. And that is that um, John wanted a more elaborate package for the album. And it was going to be based somewhat on what, what the sheet music was for rock and roll, which had 64 pages of photos from the original artists behind each song. And it was designed in the format for a live show. But they couldn't do that because it had to be rushed out. And he, he did that himself. Mm -hmm. Capital did not do that. He did that himself and it came out sometime, you know, after the album. And again, it, it didn't have the impact it would have had. Right. Uh, if it had come out, you know, in, with, with the album. Yes, I think he had very elaborate plans for a TV commercial. Yeah, that's the other thing. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and uh, the album itself, because there were all these stars, you know, dropping in uh, to the recording studio in Los Angeles. And he was gonna have, you know, complete, you know, something along, I think something along the lines of, of Walls and Bridges, which as you know, was a very elaborate, excuse me, very oh. elaborate album. It's great, the booklet inside with the lyrics and the drawings from John's childhood. And yes. so he's just basically pointing out that, you know, there's a lot of planning that goes into this and um, a lot of care and thought in the packaging. So because of the fact that Roots came out the way it did. Now, Roots was only on the, the commercial, was um, only on television for how long? Because Capital. I, I think it was less than a, less than a week. Okay. Uh, it was uh, as soon as, uh, as soon as the, um, the rock and roll album came out, he pulled the commercials and we had sent out telegrams to the, to the TV studios saying, 
This is not the authorized, <clears throat> the authorized version of a John Lennon album, Beware. Uh, but he pulled it right away. And I think the number is 1,250 copies that he had sold mm. uh, at the time. Okay. That's not really a lot, <laughs> no. considering no. it's John Lennon. And um, yeah, I, I had heard that um, the album was only available for three days for people to buy. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Well, the ad started on, uh, I think, uh, February like 7th or 8th, and the rock and roll came, came out on the 13th uh, mm -hmm. when they shipped uh, into the stores uh, around the country. And either that day or shortly thereafter, uh, he stopped advertising. And, and once he stopped advertising, I guess they, they stopped selling the album unless you had already put in your, uh, your order. Right. And, you know, and when the case was over, uh, Morris had to turn over all of the unsold albums. Uh, and there were a couple of boxes of them, plus eight track tapes. That's right. Yeah. Remember the eight track tape? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember taking them up to the, uh, to the Dakota and giving them to Yoko sometime in 1977. Uh, I think it was after their, their big trip. Remember they went to Japan for several months in 77 with, uh, with Sean to visit her mm -hmm. family and, you know, kind of just chill out. Right. Um, so those boxes uh, of uh, records and eight track tapes must be, you know, somewhere in the Lennon Ono archives. Mm -hmm. It's probably at the Dakota still. I would probably. Yeah. yeah. But I had heard also that John ordered a copy of Roots and it took him like a month before he got it in the mail. I don't know how true this is, but this, this is I, what I think he did. I think he had one of the people in, the, in his office at Capitol right. uh, order it. Uh, I never saw it when, when I was up at the Dakota, but, but, but the other thing is, you know, he never listened to it. Hmm. Okay. He did not want to hear the, uh, the album because he knew it was going to be painful to listen to. All right. Now we mentioned the TV commercial. That was the other thing that surprised me, what John was planning to do. I never knew this until I read it in your book about uh, he was going to make a parody of Chubby Checker had a TV commercial at that time for, I guess, one of his collections. It was supposed yeah. to be in part a parody of that and of a 7-Up commercial that was going on at the same time with a guy, I guess, looking like he's from the 50s with a leather suit. Only John was going to be in a leather suit. So yeah. he had all these plans for it. And because Roots came out so quickly, they shelved the idea. Well, and he, the, the, there were pictures of him in the, um, uh, in the song sheets. Okay. That volume you talked about before, which we had introduced into evidence. It was a picture of him dressed up with his hair slicked back and everything, yeah. and, you know, the leather jacket. Right. I don't know whether you've ever seen that. I haven't. I really should try and hunt one down. Might not be that easy to find. I should, I should put some uh, photos from that on, uh, uh, on the website. Yeah. yeah, it was an interesting, uh, it, it was like you said before, Ken, it was, it was kind of presented as a show. It was going to be a show right. with, with each one of the pictures of each one of the uh, original artists. Okay, now I'm a little bit confused about the three songs and which ones came out. Obviously, you can't catch me on rock and roll. Ya Ya was a song, well, Le Levy is credited as being a songwriter, whether that's <laughs> accurate or not. He's, um, he's no more of a songwriter on that than, than you or I were. Uh -huh. <laughs> me. I had thought that all three songs had to be from the Big Seven publishing company. And Yaya is not listed as being from Big Seven, but I guess that's one of the songs that counts. Yes, it did. Uh, it did, and <clears throat> and I think I think Yaya. Well, I don't know. 
I, I don't know whether it was mentioned in the settlement record, settlement of the case that was that was on the record, that was dictated on the, the record in front of uh, uh, the federal judge. Okay. At the time in October of 73. Because as you know, on Walls and Bridges, John also released a version of Yaya, with, <laughs> uh, Julian on drums. And I'm wondering if that was supposed to count at all, even though the three was supposed to be on the same album, was John thinking maybe this could count? I. I don't think he was thinking about that. I think he just he just thought. I'm not even sure he knew that Yaya was a was a Morris Levy song. I'd have to think about that or go back and look at some documents. But um, I think it was just Julian was there. Uh, he was visiting uh, for a couple of weeks in the, for his summer vacation, mm. uh, and he was probably hitting the drums. And John, you know, did this. What was it like? 60 seconds? Right. Yeah. Very short. Maybe? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just didn't know if maybe in John's mind, he was goofing around and thought maybe we could use this as one of the three songs. But um, the third song, correct me if I'm wrong, was that going to be Angel Baby? Was Angel Baby one of the it songs? Was be Angel Baby or Be My Baby? So Morris and oh, he, the publisher of both. Yeah, he dropped both of those songs on the last day. On the last day that well, he was working on it, I think it was uh, February 5th. In fact, I think he even, he even got Harold Sider on the phone and said, Harold, these two songs are awful. You know, can I drop them? Uh, I, th I think he testified to this in, in his deposition. Hmm. Um, and Harold said, yeah. If, if, they're, if they're terrible, don't put them on. Don't put them on the rock and roll album. We'll, you know, we'll deal with it somehow. So then in essence, there were no three songs. There were two on rock and roll that came out. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And you can't catch me. So then Morris had a leg to stand on there, although it was only an oral agreement because there were supposed to be three songs and only two came oh, out. That wasn't an oral agreement. That was part of the settlement uh, that, was, that was put on the trial record uh, in October of 1973. So remember there was, a, there was a, a third part to the case where uh, we, uh, we permitted uh, Morris to uh, make the allegation that had there been uh, three songs, he would have made hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, if had there been three songs on the album. Mm -hmm. And and that trial, that was John. John did not have to go to that trial. And uh, when when he finished, I think it was April seventh of nineteen seventy six. He said, "That's it." Uh, I said, "You know, we're gonna we're gonna do this third part to get it out of the way." but you don't have to be there. He said, that's fine. I don't want to come. I don't want to listen to any more of, uh, of Shirtman's uh, uh, lies. Right. Uh, so, so we tried that case and, and the award there was only $6,795. Mm -hmm. It was a complete failure to prove that Morris would have made hundreds of thousands of dollars because his argument was if John Lennon recorded one of my songs, other people would cover it. Mm -hmm. We all know what you know cover versions are, uh, and uh, he wasn't able to prove that. And Morris also had to pay EMI money, you owed them money, and John as well. Yes, he lost money in the deal. He didn't just get the the six thousand. Oh. Oh, he lost a lot of money. I don't know what, what he was paying his, his lawyers, but um, you know, it was a lot of time spent uh, mm -hmm. on this case. And then in the appeal, he hired a separate law firm to represent him as opposed to um, Big Seven. And the reason he did that, and I didn't really explain this in the book, was that gave him uh, more um 
a longer brief, court brief, to be able to file with the judge. You could file a brief up to 100 pages. Mm -hmm. And that permitted, since he had hired another law firm to represent him and still had Shirtman's firm representing him uh, on the appeal, he could file two briefs, 100, up to 100 pages each, if he wanted to. Okay. So, you know, he had to pay Shirtman for Shirtman's firm for the, all of that time that was spent in 1975 and 76 during the trial, and then the appeal, uh, and then he had to pay the other firm. And then, uh, as, as, as you read in the book, um, he, he went behind my back and wouldn't settle with John and settled with Capital for $170,000 as opposed to, I think they were awarded 240,000. So he settled for 170,000. I don't know whether he paid them. I know he paid them a down payment of 20,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the judge reduced the, the damages to John and he wound up with something in the area of $80,000. $80, okay. So the case was a, not only a, a, a psychological uh, blow to uh, Morris and, and kind of showed the industry that he was uh, uh, he was not untouchable that you could really fight him if you wanted to um, and then he, he had outrageous legal fees hmm. I'll bet you were so relieved when this whole thing ended <laughs> <laughs> well I, I was but it was kind of a letdown because you know I was on this high for you know, uh, a couple of years, and uh, uh, and I was during that 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 1976 year. I tried two other cases, uh, one in federal court uh, in the early part of the year when we had a break in the the Lennon case, mm. and then I tried a case in uh, Nashville in uh, September. So it was a busy year, but yeah, it was fun. One other thing, you know, while all this was going on. John still had to deal with the immigration authorities trying to deport him. He had that on his back, plus this. I'm not sure how much Alan Klein and dealing with him and problems with him weighed on his mind. Did, did you see any of that when you, when you were with John, or was he just focused on this case and nothing else? We, we didn't talk about the, 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 the Klein case. Hmm. Um, he was he was really focused on this. Was he concerned about the um, immigration? The immigration case, yes. And and sometime in the next week or so, I'm going to publish a uh, on my website uh, a a chapter about a small part that that I played in the immigration case. Um, Basically, the, by, by 1975, you know, uh, Nixon was out of office. Nixon and, and Strom Thurmond, the senator from uh, South Carolina, were the ones who dreamed up this uh, getting him out of the country because of all his anti-Vietnam War uh, rallies that he was going to uh, and uh, performing at. Uh, and by then, they were... Nixon was gone. Thur Thurman was still in the Strom Thurman was still in the Senate, but the whole thing had kind of died down. And um, and I knew that two of my partners at Marshall Bradder knew the United States Attorney in Manhattan at the time, who was handling the immigration case. Hmm. Um, and um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but um, I, I arranged for, for them to um, sit down with, with the U.S. attorney, a man named Paul Curran, uh, kind of off the record, got John's permission, got Leon Wilde's permission uh, to do that. And um, there were a couple of things that happened uh, that helped John's case. But uh, uh, other than discussing that, that with him, um, no, it never came up in any of our conversations. He was, when we were together, he was focused on 
mm. on this case. Okay, so you're going to put that part of your story on your website? Yes. Okay. Yes, right. I am. I'm looking forward to reading that then. Oh. Let I'll, me know when it's I'll, up and I'll share I'll it. Let me know when it goes up. Okay. Now, I know that you said towards the end of the book that um, you had you had met Yoko five days before John was killed at the record plant, but you didn't want to, I guess, disturb John while he was working. You kind of regret that. But um, did you talk at all to John from the moment this case was, was over? Any time between then and when he died? Once, no, once the... Um... Once the appeal was over and I called him and told him what were the result was, I think the decision on the appeal came out in uh, April of 77. After that, I, I did, not, uh, did not talk to him. Hmm. Um, when, when I stopped by the record plant on December 3rd, um, Yoko was not friendly. I don't know why. Hmm. Uh, I don't know why, and uh, I, I should have asked because I was surprised to see her there. I didn't, I didn't know he was, he was going to be there. I went to see a, uh, a client of mine, Eve Moon, who had just started recording an album <clears throat> for Capital mm -hmm. Incidents. Um, and, um, and I've always regretted that I just didn't say, you know, what studio? Because at that point, I was representing the record plant. I was their the record plant's lawyer. Oh, wow. Um, and, um, and I should have said to her, what, what studio is? Mm -hmm. Where is John? In studio A, B, or, or is he upstairs uh, on the third, the top floor? And I didn't. And that was <laughs> mm. one of those things you, you know, you look back on, things right. you that you regret. We've all, we've all done. Because <clears throat> I know he would have been glad to see me. Sure. Um, actually, your camera just went up higher, so you're lower in the camera if you want to adjust. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Much yeah. better. Okay. All right. Sorry. And I know that you said that John's death really affected you. I guess in how you wanted to. It did. It was a you know, I, I tell the story about how I got, I got a call at 20 minutes of uh, 12. I was asleep out in New Jersey and uh, um, turn on the TV, friend said, you know, uh, John Lennon's been shot. I think he's dead. And they had interrupted the Johnny Carson show. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a real blow. It was a blow because uh, uh, it was a fun case. It was a very successful case. Uh, John and I had had gotten, you know, close and, and be friends. Were we buddies? Were we going out, you know, for lunch or dinner or, you know, all the time? No. No. But we developed a relationship where he he trusted me and he appreciated what I was doing and I trusted him and I appreciated how involved he was. Uh, in the case, and that had a lot to do with, with the success. Sure. The case. So it, it really hit me hard, uh, and um, and if I start thinking about it again, it, it still bothers me. Oh. This, you know, you know, it was a, whoops, you know, uh, Ken, it was a, it was, it was a terrible tragedy, a, a complete waste uh, it, it never leaves us no. you know, i feel like it happened yesterday when yeah. something like that has such an impact on you you can feel like it just happened yeah. but i think what you had said in your book was that i guess maybe because the last five years of john's life he did what he really wanted to do take some time off from the public eye raise sean be a house husband do those things it made you want to do just what you wanted to do in your heart, what was meaningful to you. It did, it did, it really, it really changed my life. Uh, and, um, and it led to me taking, uh, taking a stand in my uh, personal life, 
which uh, ultimately led to um, uh, the end of my marriage at that time. Hmm. Um, but it was it was something that uh, that I had to do. Uh, it was very difficult to do, but uh, it it dramatically changed my life. Where I I finally was li- was was going to live the life that I wanted to live, mm-hmm. but not that not somebody else wanted me to. Uh, and um, about 12 or 13 years uh, later, um, uh, I met my uh, present wife and we've been married, it'll be 25 years in uh, September. Congratulations. So, uh, thank you. So it, um, it made for a much happier, imp- much happier life. Yeah, well, it just goes to show, I mean, in so many ways, not just with the music, you know, an artist can affect your life. And John taught you to be honest with yourself. Yes. And your feelings. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, well, that's the kind of person he was, not that we talked about that, and you know, any of that personal stuff, although we did have a conversation about, uh, you know, the children that I had, that, that I had a daughter by my first marriage that uh, uh, I didn't see very often. He was in the same situation with uh, Julian. Uh, and he did not want to be in that situation, as you just pointed out very clearly, uh, with Sean. But whoever was, whoever the child was that was going to be born uh, when Yoko was pregnant, he was going to make sure that uh, he was a father. Right. That was, a, that was a very important thing that uh, that he was focused on. And that had a lot to do with him dropping out of the, the business. Mm-hmm. You know, the song, Watching the Wheels Go Around. One of his most brilliant songs ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because uh, I guess he had a lot of friends who were saying, you know, what are you doing? What, you know, you're not, you're not in the game. You're not... Uh, you know, out there on, as the, the rock and roll icon. And right. he, he wasn't interested in that. Right. That's, you know, uh, as you know, Ken, that was the one, of the one of the reasons he loved New York. Because he could be in, in the city, walk around, go to the movies, go to a restaurant, and by and large, people would leave him alone. He couldn't do that. And uh, he couldn't have done that in London or England or, you know, they would have been impossible. Yeah. Yeah, what did he say? New York is what Rome was, <laughs> you know? Yes. <laughs> so it's the melting pot, you know, so that's why yes. you love it so much. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you for spending all this time with us. And uh, on behalf of John's fans, we sure are glad that you represented him. In oh, this thank case. You, I, I appreciate your uh, uh, your reaching out to me. And uh, as I said before, if uh, this, ever you want to talk again or you have any questions, call me. Um, Definitely will. Well. I'd love to have you back on. Okay. okay. Good. This this channel is your home too. Anytime you want to talk. Great. I can't. I'd end up being my psychiatrist, so I'm just warning. <laughs> so this is your book. Lennon, the mobster, and the lawyer, the untold story, Jay Bergen. Thank you for joining me here. And thanks to all of you for watching this. This was a tremendous interview. I'm so grateful for it. Well, thank you. I'm glad I've made a new friend. (laughs) Okay. Jay, thank you so much. And we'll see you all next time.